All right, seniors, it's time for lesson two. Last week, we learned a lot of things. I'm getting new to this, just like you are. So I think I was a little bit unsure last week how the video would go, but now I think we're ready. I even heard that some of you, some of you had your parents watching the video and learning a little bit of civics with you. That's awesome. It's really cool. I'd like to give a, a start out with a little shout out too to a couple of our seniors here. Kaylee Cooper, Kaylee Taylor, Zane Halver. You guys are just like Emily and Taylor who've been getting all those taxes taken out of your paychecks. So you guys are learning about concurrent taxes just like they are. So Zane and Kaylee Taylor working at Chick-fil-A, my pleasure. Zane making my sandwiches and uh, pizza down at Geno's and Kaylee Cooper working at Piggly Wiggly, checking me out about every time I'm in there too. So uh, you guys keep working and paying into that social security. Look at my gray. I'm getting old and I need social security soon. Uh, the last lesson was on the preamble and you learned about the goals. And I was really excited about your discussion post because the discussion post we were able to talk about whether America has met those goals or not, and I enjoyed reading all of your answers on that. Today we're going into the three branches of government. But before I do, as always, I have a little activating thing. If I can back my screen up, activate. I gotta get your brains going today. Indy, the seven-year-old convict? Well, yeah, Indy was pulled over when he was seven. Let's tell you the story. Indy had a little four-wheeler when he was seven. It was a little 50, a little Suzuki. Had a throttle limiter on it. It would probably only do about 15 to 20 mile an hour max open. Uh, when he would just push the throttle down, it wouldn't even go very fast. And a uh, little seven-year-old Indy would be on that four-wheeler just like this. Wee! <laughs> we decided we were gonna go right up on Golly Mountain. So we left in Anstead, my uncle's house, and we rode on the side of the road, and I told Indy to just follow behind me. We rode on the side of the road, up past the head start up there in the holler to where we could go up on the mountain through Blue Turn. I was looking back over my, my shoulder to check on Indy to make sure he was back there, and every time I looked back there, I could see him. Wee! He was keeping up with me. I turned my, my shoulder back around to look at him, or turn my head over my shoulder to look at him about the time we got to the head start, and I saw something very strange. The blue light special. That's right, the town cop was behind us in high-speed pursuit with his lights on. Wee! Unbelievable. We were doing about 15 mile an hour. Some of you guys are driving now, so you maybe you've experienced the blue light special in your rearview mirror. <sighs> Olivia Burford, you've been driving. You drove down to my house one time, I remember. I hope you haven't seen the blue light special in your rearview mirror yet. But there me and Indy were, seven-year-old Indy, the cop behind us, high-speed pursuit at 15 mile an hour. Beep. I pull over, Indy follows me. Indy looks over his shoulder and sees the cop. The cop pulls in there sideways with his lights on, gets out of the car. And Indy says, Dad, what's going on? At this point in time, being the father of the year, I couldn't resist. I said, Indy, they're probably taking you to jail, man. <laughs> Indy said, Dad, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> I said, I can't do nothing about it. But anyway, I talked to the cop. The cop was like, hey, look, uh, he's not allowed to be riding that four-wheeler. I said, look, the town council has determined that we could ride on the side of the road as long as we were riding slow. We could go up on the mountain here. And he talked to me about how um, that rule was for adults only, not for kids. And even though I tried to say he was with me, he still didn't like that very much. And he said, kids weren't allowed on that road. And I questioned the law a little bit and said, come on, man, really, he's just with me. This is kind of a stupid law. And the cop said this to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, I don't make the law, son. I just enforce it. Now, luckily, he let me off with a warning and didn't give us a ticket. But 
I'm trying to get your brain to start just a minute thinking about the executive branch of government. They can't make laws. Their job is to only enforce them. So we're going to look at those three branches of government today. In the last lesson, you learned about how the Constitution has a separation of powers, where powers are divided between state and federal. Some of them are shared, like taxes, right, Zane? Some of them are delegated only to the federal government, like declaring war. And some of them are reserve powers left up to the states to decide. And we gave you some examples of those in the last lesson. But today, we're going to our first essential question. And I think you already know the answer to this. Why does the Constitution allow for a separation of powers and branches? Well, it's pretty simple. Our founding fathers did not want one branch of government from having too much power. And they wanted powers that were shared between the federal government and the states. Now, I think you may have to back that up, or as Indy used to say when he was a little kid, back forward it and pause it so you can copy that down. I'll give you a better version right here of the screen. Okay, there you go. Go ahead and pause it and copy EQ number three down. We're back. Now, I hope you know, from middle school at least, there are three branches of government. We're going to get into them in a minute. Maybe you can name them. Maybe you know what they do. But mostly I've found that most of our seniors, even seniors, sometimes don't understand what the three branches of government can do. But EQ number three, pretty simple. Our founding fathers did not want one branch from having too much power than the other. They wanted those powers shared. So they were pretty brilliant in their plan, really. And that's why the cop told me, he don't make the laws, he just enforces them. Now, we're going to go on to essential question number four here. Essential question number four says, hey, give us an example of how the checks and balances work. You can pause that and write that down, and then I'm going to explain it to you and talk it to you. And, and not talk it to you, but talk to you about it. How's that? So give you an example. We're going to learn just in a minute that the legislative branch makes the laws. So Congress, that's our federal legislative branch, but they can make laws, but check. There's a check there. The president can use a veto and override it. Now, back in the day, when I was young and didn't have all this gray, I played basketball in high school for a coach who never wore a whistle. He never used a whistle in practice at all. Coach Spicer was his name. You know what he would do? He would just holler, check! And everybody had to stop. And then he would explain who was doing something wrong. One, one time in practice, he hollered, check, and we all stopped. And Coach Spicer said, if you done something wrong, raise your hand. Well, I was looking around. Nobody was raising their hand, so I said, it was me. He said, what'd you do wrong, Eads? I said, I don't know, Coach, but nobody else was raising their hand, so it must have been me. And he said, take off running suicides. If you don't know what you did wrong, then you need to run. So I ran. But he never blew a whistle. He just yelled, check. So I always think of him when I think about checks and balances because Congress can pass a law, check, but the president can veto it. Another example is the president, as we've learned, he can appoint people. He can appoint people to his cabinet. He can appoint people to the Supreme Court, but he, I mean, he has that power in the executive branch of government. He can appoint someone and President Trump has appointed someone to the United States Supreme Court. But check, the Senate, the United States Senate has to approve it first. So there's a check and a balance there in government. And these examples are found all through the Constitution. And it's put in there in place just so, it's put there in place so that 
One person or one branch doesn't have more power than the other, and they're always checking each other. Check! Like my high school coach. Shout out to Coach Spicer. I still remember those days. Now, we have four simple vocabulary words that we're going to put into our notes. So let's take a look at them. The first thing, of course, are the three branches. Hopefully you know the names of these, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the executive branch. Now I'm like the cat in the hat and I have many tricks up my sleeve, so check these out. You see where I underlined that L? Do you see where I underlined this L? Do you see the L on my forehead? <laughs> See, the L, the legislative branch, makes laws. And at the federal level, it's our Congress. They're the ones that make our federal laws. The judicial branch, judge, they're the ones that judge our laws or interpret them. And at the federal level, this is known as the highest court in the land, the United States Supreme Court. For example, in the last unit, I told you that you that the I told you that the Supreme Court ruled that any state who had laws that banned same-sex marriage was unconstitutional. And they had to erase those. And states like West Virginia and Georgia, they had to change the laws that uh, outlawed gay marriage. So that's an example of the Supreme Court getting to interpret the law as to whether it's constitutional or not. But guess what? The Supreme Court doesn't make laws. That job belongs to Congress. Congress can interpret the laws, but the Supreme Court can't make the laws. It's a little check there in our government. And the last one, of course, I about fell over that chair right there. Y'all didn't see that, I hope. The last one, of course, is the executive branch. Look at the E. Executive. Ooh, the E. Yes, the executive branch enforces the laws, or it's charged with carrying them out. And, of course, at the federal level, the person in charge of carrying out the laws or enforcing them is the presidency. Now, you may want to pause this screen and write those down. We're back. The three branches of government, legislative branch, L, makes laws. The judicial branch, judges, the root word of judicial, they judge or interpret the laws. The United States Supreme Court. And, of course, the executive branch, E, enforces or carries out the laws. Those are three branches of government. That's their job to do, and they're set up that way so that one branch doesn't have too much power over the other ones. We have a couple more words to go. Two more. And the last ones are checks and balances and a veto. The checks and balances are put into the Constitution and they're, they do that just like we've been learning about. So that one branch doesn't have more power than the other. For the answer to that one, you can see, I said, just go back up to EQ number three and four for your answer on checks and balances. And a veto is to reject or turn down a law. Remember, I talked about that a while ago. Congress can make a law. If President Trump doesn't like it, he can veto the law. So it would work in the words of my high school coach. It would be, Congress passes a law, but check, the president can veto the law. But check, there's another one there. Congress can also override a presidential veto as long as they have two-thirds of a majority vote. So there's all kinds of those checks and balances. Now we have a math question. A simple majority is 51%. How much is a two-thirds majority of Congress to override a presidential veto? What percentage is two-thirds? That would be 66.6666666%. So uh, a supermajority is a little tougher to get than a simple majority, but Congress does have the power to override a presidential veto and it would become a law anyway. 
So that's our lesson for today. It's been a lot shorter than the last one. The three branches of government, make sure you know what they do. Make sure you know at the federal level what those are. Congress, the Supreme Court, the presidency, the executive branch is the president. The United States Supreme Court is, is our federal judicial branch and Congress is our federal legislative branch. Remember, it's just like the cop told me and Indy. I don't enforce the law, son. Wait, let's back up. It's just like the cop told me and his seven-year-old Indy. I don't make the law, son. I just enforce them. Until next time, there'll be some assignments for this. But until next time, I'll see you. Can't wait to get back on the video. Actually, I can't wait to get all of you back in here again with me so that we can learn together and I can have you sitting in front of me instead of me looking at this camera. <sighs> Until then, you seniors are unique and valuable. Can't wait to see y'all. Wait, before you go, let's see. I gotta show Emily something. Emily Dempsey, where are you at? You're out there somewhere. Probably at work, paying my social security. Emily, I think that that uh, has your name on it. So I know you're always trying to pilfer through my doors and eat some food. So I just decided to save you some stuff. <laughs> All right. I guess uh, to end the video, just to review quickly, we have branches and separation of powers in our Constitution for one reason, and that's just to keep one branch from having all of the power. And that's why there's checks and balances set up. And a separation of power where some of the powers are left up to the states. You guys remembered that uh, from the video before. Reserve powers are for states because it has the S, Taylor Brown. That's right, that's what you wrote in your assignment. Uh, delegated powers left up to the federal government. And concurrent powers are both shared by state and federal, like taxes. So until next time, we'll see you later. And I hope that you take really good notes. Remember, take good notes because I'm not, I'm not using this textbook right now. I, have the, the, uh, I haven't put in the textbook links into Schoology yet. We don't really need it right now because I have all of it right here. And it's my job to take it out of here, twist it around a little bit, and then stick it right there in your noggin. That's what my job is. So hopefully it is sticking. Some of you guys liked the goals to the Constitution, the preamble. Some of you liked remembering it better, good cop style. And you talked about that in your assignment. So I hope that that worked and it's stuck in your little noggin a little bit right there for you to remember. Until next time, we'll see you later.